Hello, I'm Helen. I'm a third year PhD student at Lincoln College, Oxford, and my research focuses on the mechanism of action of antidepressants and particularly what happens when people come off their treatment. But today I'm going to talk to you about antidepressants a little more generally, in particular how they affect your brain. So the objectives of this session are to describe how common antidepressants affect synapses, to describe how antidepressants might be having their therapeutic effect and how this might change our view of the world, and to discuss the limitations of the current treatments, but also to have a think about some kind of new approaches to treating depression. So for this session, you'll need something to write with, so a pen or paper or a whiteboard, and I'll also give you the chance to have a go at some of the experiments I mentioned, so get ready to pause the video and follow the link on the screen. So I just wanted to start with a little bit of an introduction onto depression and antidepressants. So depression is one of the most common chronic illnesses in the world, and it's characterised by low mood and feelings of lack of enjoyment, which lasts for at least a few weeks. But in many cases, it can last for many months and even years. Antidepressants are currently the first line pharmacological treatment for depression, and the class that doctors are preferring at the moment are called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. These include drugs such as fluoxetine, which is also known as Prozac, paroxetine and sertraline. SSRIs act on serotonin or 5-HT in the brain. So depending on what you want to study about the antidepressant, we have loads of different techniques that you can use. So you can look at the effect of an SSRI on cells in culture. So if you're interested in gene or protein expression, you can also look at their behavioural effect on animal models and the resultant effect on brain neurochemistry. We can also study SSRIs in people by using brain scanning techniques such as fMRI and EEG. And we can use clinical trials to study the effects of new drugs and whether they're better than older treatments or placebo controls. We can also do long term prospective studies, which is where a population of patients are studied over many, many years uh, to see the long term effects of SSRI treatment. And researchers are also now using computational modelling techniques to better understand which antidepressants work well for different patients. But how do SSRIs actually affect the synapse? In a minute, I'm going to walk you through how SSRIs affect 5-HT transmission. But first, I want you to pause the video for two minutes and have a go at drawing a synapse and label the key proteins that are involved in synaptic transmission. Think back to what you've studied in school so far. You probably haven't done 5-HT synapses specifically, but have a think about what other types you've looked at. They all work in quite a similar way. If you'd like a bit of revision first, there's a YouTube video on the screen. It gives you a really quick summary of synaptic transmission. Then once you've drawn your synapse, have a think about how a serotonin reuptake inhibitor might be affecting transmission. So I'll see you back here in a couple of minutes. So welcome back. This is my drawing of a 5-HT synapse. So in the presynaptic neuron, we have vesicles which contain neurotransmitter, in this case 5-HT. We have voltage gated calcium channels and we also have the 5-HT or serotonin reuptake transporter. In the postsynaptic neurons, we have 5-HT receptors which are able to detect 5-HT in the synapse. So when an action potential arrives at the presynaptic neuron, this depolarizes the membrane and causes the voltage gated calcium channels to open. This causes an influx of calcium into the neuron. This calcium then causes the vesicles to move towards the presynaptic membrane and fuse and release their 5-HT into the synapse. This is then detected by the postsynaptic receptors, which in this case are excitatory, meaning they're causing a depolarization and a new action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. However, this kind of response to 5-HT very much depends on what receptors you have expressed on the postsynaptic neuron. So in some cases, the receptors can be inhibitory and cause uh, the neuron to fire even less. And in some cases, binding to these receptors can trigger downstream gene expression cascades, and these can affect the functioning of the cell kind of in the long term. And so in order to stop transmission, we need to remove 5-HT from the synapse. Now, some different kinds of neurotransmitters, such as acetylcholine, which you might have heard of, have enzymes that sit in the synaptic cleft and break down the acetylcholine to remove it and stop transmission. However, 5-HT doesn't have this kind of enzyme. Instead, it has a reuptake transporter, which removes 5-HT from the synaptic cleft and puts it back into the neuron and either breaks it down or returns it back into vesicles. 
And this is the protein that SSRIs act on. What they do is they block this reuptake transporter. And so basically you can't take 5-HT back up out of the synapse. And this will increase the concentration of 5-HT in the synaptic cleft. In this case, where we have excitatory receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, this increase in 5-HT will increase the likelihood that our postsynaptic neuron will fire. So that's how they kind of work in theory. I just wanted to give you a little example of what this kind of looks like in practice. So this is data from an experiment that I've done recently where I can measure 5-HT released from neurons. So on the left, you can see the little diagram. This technique is called microdialysis, and it basically works like, my, like dialysis in the kidney. And so what you can do is you can put a probe into the brain and this will sample extracellular 5-HT, so 5-HT that's been released from neurons. And in this case, I'm doing it in part of the hippocampus, which is a structure associated with anxiety. And so what you can see on the right is that when I inject paroxetine, where the little arrow is, um, and paroxetine is an SSRI, so it should increase 5-HT, you can see that the levels released go up and it's actually about 100 percent and they're quite they increase quite stably. So this is just kind of demonstrating what we talked about, that if you give an SSRI, you are able to increase 5-HT in the synapse. But this increase in 5-HT at the synapses isn't enough to improve your mood. In fact, it can take several weeks, between four and six weeks of treatment with an antidepressant for you to feel better. And this is because there have to be some quite big changes in the brain to allow you to feel better. A big part of these changes incre is increasing the plasticity of your brain. So that's its flexibility or ability to learn new things. And part of that comes from uh, the fact that the brain will produce more neurons, particularly in the hippocampus. And there's also an increase in the number of connection or synapses between neurons. So what we think happens is that the antidepressant simply makes it easier for your brain to learn new things. We also think antidepressants work by affecting your emotional perception of the world. Now, this relies on a concept of emotional bias, which is how your emotions affect your kind of logical perception of the world. So on the screen now is an experimental tool designed to probe emotional bias. So what participants will be shown is a spectrum of faces that range from happy through ambiguous or neutral to sad. And what they will do is they will be really quickly shown one of these pictures and they have to rate the face as happy or sad. Now, people with depression are much more likely to rate a neutral face as sad, suggesting they have a negative emotional bias. They're seeing the world in a more negative way. On the other hand, just one dose of an antidepressant will increase, improve your emotional bias. So you're more likely to rate faces as happy, suggesting this is one way in which they might make you feel better. So if you want to have a go at an emotional bias task, I put a link on the screen to a website that will talk you through how it works. And then at the bottom, there's a little video that you can have a go and just see what it looks like. So I'll come back here in a couple of minutes when you've read this website. So now I just wanted to show you a little bit of data about what this looks like in real life. So the study on the screen was the first time that people, had, that researchers had tried repeatedly giving people antidepressants to see what effect this had on their emotional bias. And so what happened here was participants, in this case, healthy people, they didn't have depression, were given seven days of treatment with an antidepressant. And so they used a Talipram, which is an SSRI, and Riboxetine, which is a different kind of antidepressant, it's slightly older. And they compared these people to placebo controls. And what they found is that giving a patient an antidepressant will reduce the likelihood of them detecting angry, disgusted or afraid faces, suggesting it reduced their negative bias. Interestingly, the people didn't uh, increase their ability of detecting happy or neutral faces. And maybe this is because they weren't depressed in the first place. There was no underlying condition to kind of improve. Or maybe it's just they didn't have the treatment very long. Seven days is a really short treatment duration. And so these ideas kind of work together to, to form our kind of overall idea of how antidepressants work. And this is combining the idea that they increase plasticity and that they give you a more emotional, a more positive emotional bias. So 5-HT will increase at the synapse when you give an SSRI, and this will trigger downstream cascades of gene expression, which will increase the plasticity of the brain. This will then allow us to kind of better learn these more positive emotional associations and view the world in a better light. And overall, this leads to improved mood. 
However, this is a very idealistic view of how antidepressants work, and it certainly doesn't work like this for many patients. Antidepressants can work really well for some people, but they do also come with some big problems and drawbacks. So SSRIs will only work for about half of patients that have prescribed them. So this can be really frustrating if you think a treatment's going to work and then it doesn't actually improve your mood. It can also take between four to six weeks to work, as we talked about previously. And this, again, can be frustrating and even dangerous if people are really quite unwell. You might also know that starting antidepressant treatment can also produce some really bad and persistent side effects, in particular uh, insomnia and nausea are really problematic. And also coming off treatment can be really difficult. People can experience withdrawal effects such as nausea and dizziness. All of this isn't to say that antidepressants aren't great. They're a really valuable tool for helping doctors treat depression. However, scientists are now looking at kind of faster and more holistic ways to help people recover faster. So on the screen now are just a few of the new treatments for depression. On the top left, we have cognitive behavioural therapy, which is just a form of counselling or therapy. And basically this works with your antidepressant to make the process of like relearning positive associations much faster. And you might actually have seen recently that now doctors are recommending people try therapy and CBT before they even start on their antidepressants, as this alone can have a really big, can really help people. You may also heard of the gut brain axis, which is the idea that your gut bacteria have a surprisingly big effect on your mental health, although exactly how they do this is still kind of being investigated. And so one approach to helping depression is by uh, taking probiotics and this promotes healthy gut bacteria, which then kind of improves your gut brain access axis. But again, this probably won't work on its own. You'd have to use it in combination with other things. Scientists are also trying to develop fast acting antidepressants that work much faster. They don't take weeks and weeks to have their effects. An example of this that works surprisingly well is the illegal drug ketamine, which has been shown to improve mood within just a few hours of taking one dose. However, this is very much still in the trial phase. So don't go out taking ketamine thinking that it will help you feel better. Similarly, and also quite controversial, is the use of psychedelic drugs in kind of therapy sessions. So this approach relies on using an active ingredient from magic mushrooms, and this kind of helps you become more receptive and more likely to take in what's being discussed in therapy. But this is still very early on, and some people don't think it has much effect at all. Another kind of controversial and less widely used technique is deep brain stimulation. Now, this might sound a bit medieval, but basically what happens is surgeons will implant a small electrical device in regions of the brain that are involved in depression and it will apply tiny little electrical stimulations. And this is thought to alleviate mood really rapidly and works particularly well in people that haven't responded to any other treatment for depression. But again, really not very widely used. And finally, scientists are trying to use more computational modelling techniques to better understand which antidepressants work for different people. The idea is that if you can predict if someone will respond to a treatment based on kind of underlying factors about them, then you might are more likely to be able to put them on the right drug sooner and help them get better faster. So in summary, today we've learned that modern antidepressants work by altering 5-HT transmission in the brain by blocking 5-HT reuptake. We've also seen that by increasing neuroplasticity, antidepressants help us to relearn more positive associations about the world, and so we perceive it in a less negative way. And finally, we discussed how new treatments for depression are taking radically different approaches to the traditional drugs, such as cognitive behavioural therapy and the use of psychedelic drugs and deep brain stimulation. So now you've listened to all this, what I want you to do is go away and have a think about what you think is the future of the treatment of depression. Do you think it's drugs? Is it therapy? Is it a combination of these things? Or is there something we've not even thought about yet? And so if you're interested in this topic and you want to learn more, Khan Academy is a really great resource for more in-depth videos and information about biology. So they have specific videos about synapses, and this is a really great chance to dive in in more detail and understand the system more fully. If you liked hearing about depression, there's this really great online article talking about new treatments for depression. And if you're interested in neuroscience more generally, I can really recommend the book Mapping the Mind by Rita Carter. This is a book that I read while I was still in school and really made me interested in all aspects of neuroscience and will really help you dive in deeper into these topics in more detail. So all that's left to say is thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed the video.